The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Jesus said to his disciples, As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. In those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, up to the day that Noah entered the ark. They did not know until the flood came and carried them all away. So will it be also at the coming of the Son of Man. Two men will be out in the field, one will be taken, and one will be left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken, and one will be left. Therefore, stay awake, for you do not know on which day your Lord will come. Be sure of this. If the master of the house had known the hour of night when the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and not let his house be broken into. So too, you also must be prepared, for at an hour you do not expect, the Son of Man will come. The Gospel of the Lord. First off, you notice in the pews that the seasonal paperbacks have been replaced by our brand new red Lumen Christi hardbacks. Hopefully it wasn't too much of a confusion. It certainly might take a couple weeks for us to get used to the new books, but hopefully you're also find that the font is a little bit larger, easier to read. But just a couple things to note about these beautiful hardback books. First off, I don't think I said thank you. I want to say thank you because I appreciate them and hopefully you all will also appreciate each other's generosity in providing them for us. But you'll notice that it's one continuous year from front to back. And so this being the first Sunday of Advent, the beginning of the church's liturgical year, we're at the very beginning on page, I think, two or something. Two, four, wherever it was. Really very, right at the very beginning. Page two. And you'll notice that it says, first Sunday of Advent, year A. It's good for us to know that the church has a three-year liturgical cycle for the Sunday readings, and so we just finished year C, the Gospel of Luke, and we're entering into now year A, the Gospel of Matthew. St. Mark gets, gets year B, and St. John feels left, no, John doesn't feel left out. He's very happy. He gets all of the season of Easter, all three years, and then because Mark is so short, he share, shares some of his summer, and John gets some of the summer of year B. So all four Gospels are kind of covered throughout the three-year cycle. And so it's good to know that, we're all, that we will be in year A for the last bit of 2013 and then for the majority of 2014. And so when you come to look for the readings, you need to know two things. One, not only what Sunday it's going to be, that first Sunday of Advent, second Sunday of Advent, but also what year we're in. So just keep in mind, year A. Secondly, you'll notice that as you continue flipping through, it will eventually switch out from the liturgical year to the calendar of saints, and, there, and there's special prayers and whatnot for each of the different saints. And then when you get to the gray section, it has the order of the Mass. So when you bring your friends to Mass and they're not quite sure what the responses are, tell them to open up the book and to be able to follow along with the order of the Mass. Also, it began at about page 1,000, which is getting towards the end now, there's beautiful prayers. There's prayers of preparation for Mass. That if you get here early, you could pray. Prayers of thanksgiving after Mass, after receiving Holy Communion. When there's some silent time, you can come and pray some of those prayers. There's also a preparation for the sacrament of penance and an examination of conscience. As you keep flipping through, there's also a set of Stations of the Cross and some other beautiful prayers by different saints. So I encourage you to use this as a prayer book when you come to the church so that you can pray and you can be lifted up and, and by the prayers of different saints. 
for just as a, an example, one thing that people might want to keep in mind is the prayer to St. Michael that we always say at the end of each Mass. You can find that here. If you're not quite familiar with the words, you can follow it along in our beautiful new Missal. So that's our little introduction to that. And now on to the idea, though, that Advent is the beginning of our liturgical year, this first Sunday of Advent. And during this season of preparation, the church not only wants to indicate that Christmas is only a few weeks away that we can keep track of as we work our way around the Advent wreath, but she also wants this liturgical season to remind us that we need to make a beginning to a new commitment, a recommitment to the faith of all, for all those who follow Christ. That this time of prayer and this path of penance should endeavor to assist us to truly welcome the message of the one who became incarnate in our own human flesh so as to save each and every one of us. In fact, the entire liturgy of Advent, this whole season, is meant to spur us to awaken in our Christian life so that we will have a vigilant disposition to wait for our Lord who is truly coming. It was this, these, this, was this idea that our Lord is coming needs to be present in our hearts and in our minds. In 2006, at the beginning of his pontificate, on this, well actually it was yesterday, the, on the evening of, before the first Sunday of Advent, Pope Benedict spoke, these, spoke about this message. He said, Awaken! Remember that God comes, not yesterday, not tomorrow, but today, now. The one true God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, is not a God who is there in heaven, unconcerned with us and our history, but he is the God who comes. And so we want to think of there are the three comings of Christ that we can consider during this Advent season. A little easy way to remember them is that the three comings are that he comes in history, in mystery, and in majesty. In history, a little over 2,000 years ago. And we want to celebrate that birth uh, in Bethlehem. In mystery, for he comes to enter into each one of our hearts. And that is possible each and every day. That's what our whole Father, Pope Benedict, was speaking, is that he is coming now to encounter him in the sacraments, in the liturgy, to encounter him in the Holy Eucharist, to let him come into your heart in mystery. And then, of course, the second coming of Christ in majesty, when he will come to judge the living and the dead. During the past weeks of November, the liturgical year ended with, by directing our gaze upon that second coming of Christ. And this first Sunday of Advent begins the new liturgical year, but our focus is the same on those comings of Christ, that Christ is coming, and the gospel says we need to be awake. We need to be aware that he is coming to judge the living and the dead. And so we want to see that this is precisely because as disciples of the Lord Jesus, we are participants in the mission of the church. And the church, as we say every Sunday, is waiting in blessed hope for the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. The Catholic Church is a missionary church, always moving forward towards the second coming of Christ. As the prophets in the Old Testament prepared the people of the Old Covenant for that first coming, so too the prophetic mission of all the baptized is to evangelize everyone, to prepare them for the second coming. The baptized disciple is called to be the confirmed apostle. To be a disciple of Jesus Christ, to be an apostle, is the vocation of every Christian believer. And yet we see that this is something which our society needs. Our society is not aware and awake and waiting for the coming of Christ. But rather, as Jesus alluded to in the gospel, our society is like that at the time of Noah, eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, or perhaps not even bothering with it nowadays. Certainly, our society is immersed in and obsessed with the here and now, the physical reality, the material world. And Advent and Christmas have even been hijacked by our society, by, hijacked by power and greed and a fixation on material possessions to possess the latest gadgets, 
Malls and supermarkets and stores began the Christmas season, maybe the weekend before Advent, or I guess maybe the season began on Black Friday, but the preseason began, I think, after Halloween. And it all ends the day after Christmas, when people return those gifts that they didn't really want or need in the first place. They have it all wrong. Advent begins today, after Thanksgiving. Christmas doesn't begin until Christmas Eve Mass. And Christmas won't end the next day. But it continues throughout all of January until we celebrate the baptism of our Lord. And so we want to see how shallow and frivolous our society has become, fixating on the temporary and not seeing the true, the lasting, that really, really good that can change our lives. I'm sure you and I both shared in sorrow and maybe a little shock at the throngs trying to press into stores these past few days. Maybe you remember back in 2008 when there was that man at Walmart who was crushed to death by the throngs trying to get into the store. Maybe you heard in the news that the, there was a man down in Virginia, southern Virginia who was stabbed in the parking lot while they were trying to decide who was going to get to park in some stupid parking spot so that they could go into Walmart and get these deals. And I'm not trying to badmouth Walmart. It just seems that that's the location of two terrible crimes of materialism. But our society, it is very clear, needs a lot of healing. Just imagine... If those same amount of people were pushing down the doors of our church every Sunday, trying to receive the bread of life, just imagine if the throngs of people were lining up for hours to receive the forgiveness of their sins, waiting in the lines for confession. What a different world. What a world we would live in. Pope Francis just issued a new work. It's called On the Joy of the Gospel in which he writes, the great danger in today's world, pervaded as it is by consumerism, is the desolation and anguish born of a complacent yet covetous heart, the feverish pursuit of frivolous pleasures, and a blunted conscience. Advent, my friends, is a time for all of us to wake up. My dear friends, let us recall the words from this Sunday's second reading. St. Paul writes, let us then throw off, throw off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us conduct ourselves properly as in the day, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in promiscuity and lust, not in rivalry, not in jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provisions for the desires of the flesh. St. Paul provides us with a solution to the world's problem. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Over and over again, I have preached Sunday after Sunday a similar message that could be summed up in the question, do you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ? Have you had that encounter with God, which is the entire reason for our religion? I remember Deacon Clark several Sundays ago addressed that question with the beautiful words of St. Augustine, who wrote, To fall in love with God is the greatest of romances. To seek him, the greatest adventure. To find him, the greatest human achievement. If we really fall in love with Jesus Christ, we will be enthusiastic and joyful witnesses of his gospel. But as Pope Francis points out, too many Christians seem to live lives of Lent without any Easter. And so he invites all of us to have that personal relationship with Jesus. He writes, I invite all Christians everywhere at this very moment to a renewed personal encounter with Jesus Christ, or at least an openness to letting him encounter them. I ask all of you to do this unfailingly each day. No one should think that this invitation is not meant for him or her, since no one is excluded from the joy brought by the Lord. 
Isn't that his message? No one is to be excluded. And so we need to listen to St. Paul and put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the desires of the flesh. As we walk through Advent, striving to live in the light, striving to put off the works of darkness, we need to keep our minds and our hearts, our minds and our hearts, fixed on the love that God has for each and every one of us. This is the only way that we can make no provisions for the desires of the flesh. If we are focused on Jesus Christ, if we are dwelling in his love, if we are aware of his love, if we are delighting in his love, the gospel tells us that we need to wake up to this love, that we need to be ready, that we need to be working, waiting for that day. And so I want to offer you some concrete examples of how we can make this Advent a good Advent, a time in which we wake up. First, I would assume that after this year of faith, all of us have engaged in some daily personal prayer, in some sort of Christian meditation. I encourage you to examine what that's going to be during the season of Advent. If you don't have it, of course, you need to start. But let's say you do have it. Let's say you've taken prayer to be something that you're going to do each and every day. During the season of Advent, perhaps you could mix it up for the next four weeks. Maybe you've been reading a wonderful book. Well, put that book down and pick up a new book for this new season. Something that is going to prepare you for Christmas. Maybe you've got a favorite devotion. You've been praying something, meditating on the wounds of our Lord. Well, pick up a different devotion. Maybe you need to start praying the rosary every day. Maybe you're going to pick up one of the litanies. There's some beautiful litanies if you want some examples in our Lumen Christi uh, Missal. Just another advertisement. Maybe you want to pick up a new devotional book. Another advertisement. There's lots available downstairs in our local parish bookshop. But the liturgical seasons are precisely given to us so that because we need to change. We are creatures with one foot in time, but with our eyes gazed on eternity. And so we too need to have a rhythm to our life. Some things are going to stay the same. Prayer. Advent coming each and every, time, each and every year. But some things are going to change. Advent doesn't st- last all year. And so we need to let some of, something change. Something wake us up to the newness. Secondly, I encourage you... Put an Advent wreath on your family table and gather each and every day during this Advent season as a family at that table to pray and to share a meal. Some of you are going to say, this is hard. Clearly it's hard. But But if we're going to say that our priorities are God and family, what are we going to put in front of God and family meal? Praying as a meal and then share, praying as a family and then sharing a family meal. What is going to be more important than that? Yes, it is hard. But as the first, in the first reading, we read how those preparing for the kingdom of God were working, beating their swords into plowshares. I don't know about you, but that sounds like hard work. That sounds like a commitment that I am not going to continue my previous way of life. I'm going to destroy how I used to live so as to be ready to live for the kingdom. So too, then, you and I need to make that difficult, those difficult decisions to have that family prayer time, that family meal time, each and every day. Certainly, we too can do hard things in preparation for Christmas. Thirdly, be sure that you... And if you have any, your children go to confession during this Advent season. In his first coming, Christ's call is to repentance. So that he might, we say he came that he might heal the sick, bind up the brokenhearted. Confession is not our encounter of the second coming of Christ when he comes to judge the living and the dead. It's the encounter with that first mission of Christ to heal, to bind up the wounds, to let his light shine in the darkness of our sins and to illuminate them, healing them, strengthening our lives. 
Don't miss out on the opportunity for God's forgiveness to encounter him, to meet him in the sacrament of penance. And then fourthly, I encourage you to intentionally choose your Advent traditions. We all benefit from the inspiration and the relaxation that real recreation can afford us. And during this season in which we're preparing for Christmas and during the Christmas season, certainly there are many opportunities, many traditional ways that we pause and relax and we have opportunities for recreation. But we actually need to make healthy recreation a priority. We're not robots, after all. We need this. But too often we aren't intentional about how we relax how we live our lives. We just do what everybody else does, or we just kind of go along with the flow and we find ourselves doing things. We want our encounter with God to be intentional. We want to see him in our relaxing things. And so we need to take some time to reflect this Advent, both ourselves individually, but also as a family, on how we are going to, what activities we're going to engage in what traditions we're going to live as a family, as an individual during this season of Advent. Maybe you'll want to fast from some particular activity during Advent. It is a minor season of penance, after all. Maybe you'll want to make it a family party to set up the Christmas decorations and put up the lights outside. But do it intentionally. Have the hot chocolate waiting when you come in and gather around and enjoy that celebration of festivity of lighting the house. Maybe you want to make, make it, maybe you want to watch those Christmas movies which are on the television, but do so intentionally. Gather your family, maybe invite the neighbors over and enjoy it. So, pop some popcorn, make some hot spiced apple cider. Do it with joy. Really let yourself encounter God's love. Let it be something that is preparing you for Christmas and not something that just happens. There's a beautiful tradition in the Hispanic culture of, for those nine days before Christmas. Las Posadas, the Filipinos, they seem to have the same thing. They just call it something completely different. And if you're Filipino and I mispronounce this, forgive me, but I think they call it Simbangabi. But the idea is that you take the nine days before Christmas and you go to Mass each and every one of those days. What a way that would be to focus yourself on the coming of Christ. But whatever traditions you want to do, you want to see that they are traditions which are preparing you, traditions which are filling you with true recreation, recreation, allowing you to really live, to encounter God's love and his joy. For this is what we were made for. There's a band out there, I'm, I'm going to call them a good band, but I don't really know. I have never met them, but they make good music, or at least music which I like. It's, they're called Mumford and Sons. And if you know who they are, you'll be like, oh yeah, I know them. But if you don't, you're like, who are you talking about? But they have a song out there that, that just, I think, captures. And it's a really simple song. It only has about 50 words. But it's called, Awake My Soul. And one of the 50 words, that he, well, I guess three of them, that he repeats over and over again, Awake My Soul. And the refrain, you were meant to meet your maker. Isn't that the message of Christianity? that God is coming into the world. We were meant to meet him. He came once, but he's coming into our hearts each and every day, and we will meet him again in that second coming. One of the other little lines that Mumford repeats over and over again is, in these bodies you will, we will live, in these bodies we will die. And where you invest your love, you invest your life. Where are we investing ourselves? Let's be intentional disciples of Jesus Christ. Let us accept that mission to be apostolic witnesses of joy to the world. My dear friends, we have begun Advent. Advent is the time of preparation for Christmas. Let us really live Advent, not as the world does, but as convinced, enthusiastic, and joyful disciples who are awake and ready to meet their maker, the God of love.